Welcome to Oil & Gas with Energy Law Prof. And today we get to talk about a very exciting topic, which is we're going to do your introduction to the oil and gas lease. And the reason I say that this is so exciting is because, as we know, oil and gas are the two commodities that make the modern world. In particular, oil is the reason that the United States is the world's sole global superpower because it was the center of oil production and again today is the center of the energy industry. And you already know how oil is the reason that you know, one economy does well, the other nation's economy does poorly, you know, people move to one place rather than the other, the way that industry is set up, all all of that is determined by oil and all of that as it turns out depends upon the oil and gas lease because the oil and gas lease is the way that oil and gas in the ground get shared between the landowners who it belongs to in the United States and the oil and gas companies that actually produce that oil and gas and make the investments to produce it and the reason the oil and gas lease is so important is because it revolutionized the oil industry when it was developed in the early 20th century and made possible this global transition to oil, the global economy that's completely premised on the availability of oil was developed because of the oil and gas lease. Because if we think about how it is in most parts of the world to find out you have oil and gas on your land, well, it's not necessarily a good thing because that oil and gas typically will belong to the government and that may mean a lot of disruption for you and not a lot of money. But the oil and gas lease that was developed in the US provided benefits both to landowners and to oil and gas companies. And for that reason, it fostered this incredible and dominant global oil industry that grew up here in the United States. And in fact, that oil and gas lease that was developed between landowners, farmers, ranchers, etc., here in Texas and our local private oil and gas companies is still used to this day to as a model for the development of agreements between the biggest nations that are producing oil and gas and bring in the biggest, you know, international global oil companies, super majors to come in and produce their oil and gas. It's all still based on that oil and gas lease, which really made the modern world possible. So, you know, if you've taken you know, business enterprises or biz, uh, biz orgs, you may have heard that, you know, Back in the day, the president of Columbia said that he thought the limited liability company was the single most important private legal relationship for the future of the world. You know, with apologies to him, I don't know. I think there's a good case for the oil and gas lease being the the most important legal document that's ever been created for the history of the our civilization. And, you know. We can argue about it some other time. But the, uh, today, you have your opportunity to learn a little bit about how that's structured. So keep in mind, the oil and gas lease, although we talk about it in general terms, really, of course, there are hundreds of thousands of leases out there. And those are typically uh, written following certain forms. And you know, maybe from your summer job, you know that sometimes you know, a law firm will have a certain way that it likes to write a contract, etc. Well, the same thing is true for oil and gas leases, but uh, those forms are often written by the lessees. So every different oil and gas company may have a form of oil and gas lease that it likes to use. Now, sometimes, rarely, you have leases that are mostly drafted by the landowners. If you are a landowner and looking to lease and looking to write your own lease, you know, there's some places you could look. Uh, you know, if you got help from a bank, that might be very helpful because banks that hold land and trust have to ensure that they get maximum profit from that land. And so they develop leases that are designed to accomplish that, really to, you know, to serve the interest of the property owner. Landowners associations sometimes have lease forms too that they give out as example leases that one could use. I'd warn you a little bit, sometimes those landowner association leases can uh, have very specific terms that might not work in your individual uh, situation. So drafting a lease is a big challenge. Typically the lessee, the oil and gas company, 
takes it on. And so that means the typical lease is designed to protect lessees. So I've given you an example. I've uploaded an example of a producer's 88 form. That is a form that's very often referred to, but you will see that there would be hundreds of different producers 88 forms out there as well. So it does have some common provisions. We'll talk about that, but certainly uh, even these forms evolve over time. So the form that a company is using one year might be very different from the form that it, they use the next year. Well, what are those companies looking for when they draft one of these leases? One thing, as we've talked about earlier, they want to retain the option to drill for oil and gas as long as possible, but they don't want to be obliged to drill because they're thinking about each of these different land, uh, land places as potentially a lottery ticket. So when they have a lease on one area, who knows, that might make them rich in the future, or maybe it will be this other one. And so they want to hold on to as much property and have the option to drill, but they don't want to have the obligation to drill. Okay, they also, if they find oil and gas, want to maintain that property as long as it's profitable to do so. So even if they haven't got around to producing all the oil and gas on it, they want to be able to keep it for as long as it could produce oil and gas. Now, of course, there's two parties to this negotiation. So savvy landowners and, you know, um, you know or the banks or any of those groups that are going into those negotiations uh, prepared for these kind of requests from the oil and gas companies are going to be trying to find ways to maybe limit the term of the oil and gas company's uh, option to drill, maybe to impose some obligations on them to drill for oil and gas because that will produce a royalty that will produce the most money for the landowner. Now, the courts have traditionally been aware that these leases are mostly drafted by the lessees, by the oil and gas companies. And for that reason, they have often interpret them against the lessee's interest. And one thing that we'll see, which is very different from uh, what you may be used to in terms of textual interpretation, either you know, in the contract or statutory uh, context, is that for many years, the courts would you know, frankly, make up some duties for the oil and gas companies because they view the oil and gas companies maybe as taking advantage a little bit of those lessor landowners. And so the courts would imply covenants. We'll see cases where you might see how that covenant was implied from the lease. You'll see other cases where the courts seem to imply duties that really don't seem to be in the lease at all, but those are designed to protect landowners, and we'll see how. Okay. So we've talked about before how under the typical lease, the landowner for decades would only keep about one eighth of the oil produced and the other seven eighths would go to the oil and gas company. Well, why is that? Why would the oil and gas company get to keep such a huge share of that oil and gas? And there's two basic reasons. One we've talked about, um, but, and one we're gonna go into in more detail. So, so the first reason is that a lot of the oil and gas wells traditionally have not produced oil. So for decades, it was just the norm. You drilled seven wells to find one well that actually produced oil and gas. And so when you did produce oil and gas, you had to get all your profit back from that single well. So that's a big challenge facing oil and gas companies and why they're only uh, traditionally were willing to give about one eighth of production to the landowner. As oil and gas companies have gotten more assured of finding oil and gas, they've been giving bigger royalties to the landowner. But the second thing I want you to think about is just that financial calculation from the perspective of the oil and gas company. Because the oil and gas company really has a huge number of expenses. Obviously, they have that royalty share that they have to give to the landowner. So the landowner will have to receive its one eighth or maybe now, you know, one quarter or one third. But also the oil and gas company is going to have to pay all the rents and fees that may be associated with getting a permit to drill and then drilling. They're going to have to pay taxes, of course, on any profits they make, state, federal, and municipal. They're often going to have to pay specific oil and gas taxes as well. Uh, then they're going to have to pay, of course, their operating costs of production to keep that well going. But probably the biggest single thing is they're going to have to pay the capital investment to drill that well. All the technology, all the expertise, all the employees that it takes to start oil production from that well. And of course, after paying all of that, the landowner's share, 
all those rents and fees, the taxes, the cost of operating it, the cost of building the well, they of course need to make a return on their investment. Now, what kind of return should an oil and gas company expect? Well, here's maybe one way to think about that. So if we thought about uh, an energy company that is kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from an oil and gas company, you could think about an electric utility. And the reason I say they're on the opposite end of the spectrum is the oil and gas company faces a lot of risk. As we say, said, you know, maybe the majority of wells don't end up producing oil and gas. By contrast, with that ut electric utility, the electric utility pretty much knows it's going to get paid back for its investment. And the reason for that is, think about you know, Encore that reaches your house in Dallas, or if you're in another state, think about the electric utility that serves you. When they make an investment, they get to charge a rate to all their customers that allows them to recover the full cost of that investment. So they pretty much know, because they have a monopoly in their area where they're operating, that they're going to be able to recover those costs. Now, how much profit should they be allowed to make? Well, let me tell you that typically, even a low amount of profit would be like 8 to 10% profit. And you know, if you were making a little bit more risky uh, investment as a utility that you were you know, having to deal with a lot of permitting problems that might prevent a new power line from being built or otherwise, maybe you could get you know, 15, 16, 17% return on your investment. Now you might ask, why are utilities allowed to make you know, more than one or 2%? I mean, what, if we're there guaranteed a profit, why isn't one or 2% enough? And the short answer is, Nobody would invest in a company providing one or two percent return because they could just invest in the stock market and make you know five, six, seven percent. So typically, you know that baseline rate of return sets the kind of the minimum that a company is going to expect. Okay, so if utilities are very safe investments, looking to make you know eight to fifteen percent rate of return, you can imagine that oil and gas companies are going to need a lot of assurance that they're going to make a much bigger return given that they face a lot more risk and don't have any guaranteed customers the same way that electric utility does. Okay, so with that set up, let's think about why we use an oil and gas lease rather than what might seem like a more simple and reasonable option, which is just selling the oil and gas under your land to the oil and gas company that wants to produce it. And to think about this, I think it's useful to think about this concept of economic rent and to take a concrete example. So let's imagine that there's a landowner with $66 million of oil that could be produced under her land. Now, obviously, nobody's ever going to know exactly how much oil is under their land. But for simplicity's sake, let's say we know there's about $66 million of oil under the land. Now, economic theory would say that the landowner should want to get from that resource the full economic rent. And what economic rent means is the value of that resource minus the cost of producing it and a normal profit. So basically the idea is the landowner has control to access of that resource and so they should receive everything but the cost of extracting it and a normal profit for whoever extracts it. So Laura's read up on her economic theory. She says, I have $66 million of oil under the ground. Here's the deal. We think, and again, it would never be quite this certain, but it costs $40 million to produce that oil and gas. And we think that um, you know, a normal profit might be $6 million. So I should have everything remaining after that, which is give me the rest of the $20 million. And you know, from the oil and gas company's perspective, maybe this looks like, depending on how you calculate it, a 15 or 10% uh, rate of return because they basically say, okay, look, I'm spending $40 million for the well. I'm giving Laura $20 million but I get a $6 million profit at the end of the day. So, you know, 40 plus 20, $60 million, and I get that $6 million profit. Okay, would an oil and gas company agree to that? No, they would never agree to that because of course there's much more uncertainty in each of these uh, calculations. And in fact, there's some other problems for them too that make it very risky. We say there's $66 million of oil, but what if the price of oil goes down all of a sudden? 
Well, then all of a sudden, they might not make a profit on this at all. I also want you to understand how this is actually a little bit risky for Laura because just by the same token as thinking of the oil price dropping in half, what if it doubles? And now all of a sudden, there's $132 million of oil in the ground. Well, Laura has sold her resource for $20 million and she's not getting any more. But the oil and gas company with this huge bonanza of oil under the ground is obviously gonna be very aggressive at producing it. So not only does Laura get no benefit from that, but she probably has more activity on her land, which could be an annoyance for Laura. So this one-time sale that basically, hey, I'll sell you my oil and gas for $20 million ends up being a little bit risky for both parties based on the uncertainty of what the price of oil is gonna be, the costs of extracting it, etc. So let's think about what might make more sense. Okay, what if Laura, instead of asking for $20 million up front, that was clearly unrealistic, no oil and gas company is gonna go into business for just a 10% profit, but Laura said, you know what? Don't give me any money up front. Instead, give me a share of what you produce. Give me a royalty. Now let's imagine that uh, Laura, and this is just a number calculated so that we get to round numbers. Let's say Laura asked for a 27.3% royalty. And so what that means is that if there really is $66 million of oil that's produced from the land, she's gonna end up with $18 million. Okay, so how does the oil and gas pie get divided in this case? Well, Laura's gonna get $18 million, that's great. Ovid's gonna make a profit of $8 million and Ovid's costs are gonna be about $40 million. So note, that gets Ovid to basically a 20% profit, which is a little bit more realistic. And if it turns out there's more oil and gas in the ground, of course, Ovid's gonna make more. But it reduces risk for Laura as well, because Laura, if there is more oil in the ground, if there's $132 million of oil, her royalty, therefore, is gonna double, because it's a constant share of production. So she's gonna get $36 million. On the flip side, if there's no oil and gas at all, well then Ovid is out its cost, but it doesn't have to pay anything to Laura. So it reduces risk for both parties by sharing the risk that there's either a lot of oil or very little oil in the ground. So that's the advantage of the royalty uh, versus just selling your oil and gas. And you can see that the stereotypical Texas lease is basically designed to provide most of the compensation through a royalty. So we've actually talked about this briefly before, but as a reminder, the lessee, the oil and gas company, is gonna get the exclusive right to produce oil and gas for some number of years, maybe one year, maybe three years. I've given the example of five. And then they are gonna be able to produce as long as oil and gas is produced. So as long as there's a producing well on that land, they're gonna be able to continue operating that land and keeping whatever's left after the royalty. The landowner is gonna get a bonus up front, right? Which could be a little bit of money. We'll talk about the reason for that in a second. And then they're gonna get most of the money on a successful well through the royalty, which is that fraction of production over time. We gave the example of 27.3% with the example of Laura. Traditionally, that royalty share had been one eighth. Nowadays, it tends to be more. Okay, what's the reason for the bonus? Well, remember the traditional lease gives the oil and gas company some initial amount of time, usually initial amount of years, two years, three years, five years, to search for oil and gas. And the problem, if you had only your compensation based on royalty, there's really two problems. One is you're tying up your land for some period of time where the oil and gas company has the exclusive right to develop. And really, it seems like you should get some compensation for that, even if they don't end up drilling. Secondly, if they don't owe you any money up front, you might worry that they could be taking as many leases as they want, even if they never intend to drill any of them. Because remember, those are just options for them to drill. So why wouldn't they take way more leases than they could possibly use? Because they won't owe any money on those leases until they start getting production. So they might take 10 times as many leases as they need, figure out what the best one-tenth of those leases are, drill on those, yeah, you'll owe royalty, but you never owe anything to all those other parties where you tied up their land. So for that reason, if you wanna be sure that the oil and gas company is really serious 
about producing your property, which is the only way you're gonna get a royalty, which is where you're gonna get the bulk of your compensation, then you probably want them to pay some bonus up front. So as an example, you can think about uh, Laura slightly willing to decrease her royalty. So let's imagine that instead of asking for 27.3, she just asked for 25% and she says, but I want a bonus up front. So I want $1.5 million up front. And then if you get your full $66 million of production, I'll get $16.5 million from that. So notice it's the same amount of compensation overall for Laura if we get the expected amount of production. So it's still $18 million, but she's getting $1.5 million up front. And if the oil and gas company chooses to never drill her land and just let that lease expire after three, four, five years, well, at least at the end of the day, Laura got $1.5 million out of it. So it gives her some compensation and it actually gives her some assurance that the oil and gas company probably wants to drill on her land. Because if they didn't want to drill on her land, why would they pay her that $1.5 million bonus up front? Okay, let's talk about some of the essential parts of the lease. These are all topics that we're gonna talk way more about in future classes. So first, one big question, what land and what minerals are included in the lease? Often the landowner is looking to lease their full property, but sometimes they aren't. So you have to be really clear, does it include the landowner's full property? Uh, obviously, one of the biggest things that gets negotiated is what is the bonus being paid to the lesser and what's the royalty? For decades, often the royalty wasn't negotiated much because it was just kind of set at one eighth. And in the example lease I've given you, you can see that there's not a blank for the royalty, it just says one eighth. And that was the case for decades. Nowadays, typically you would negotiate the royalty and typically it would be over one eighth. Okay, you're also gonna delay things called delay rentals, which are a charge that the oil and gas company pays every year that it doesn't drill, basically to hold onto that lease and shut-in royalties, which we discussed in an earlier class, but we'll discuss more later, and is what happens when you have a natural gas well, but there's not yet a market for that natural gas. You're allowed to shut it in and pay a low royalty to maintain that well until a natural gas market appears. Okay, other key issues that are negotiated. How long is the primary term? Is it just one year where the oil and gas has to look, uh, oil and gas company can look for oil and gas? Is it two years, three years, or five years? Uh, we, that can vary a lot. Often in the past, they were as long as 10 years. Then, how much land will a well keep? This is a more advanced topic, but if you have a really big ranch, let's say you have 5,000 acres. If the oil and gas company just comes in and drills one 40-acre drilling unit for oil, should they really be allowed to keep that whole lease as long as just that single well operates? That's a huge question that we'll talk about. How will the royalties be calculated? It's pretty simple for oil because oil prices tend to be similar in different markets. But as we've talked about, natural gas mar markets can be very different from place to place. So are you gonna use the price of natural gas at the wellhead, at the local market, or maybe at some national market? Are you gonna use that to calculate what that one eighth or one third share is? And that can be particularly tricky when you have gas that's not sold on the property for a given price that you can calculate, but is actually improved and transported. Uh, and its price is basically um, is increased over time as that gas is brought to market. Should you use that final price that it sells for, which the landowner would like, or should you use what it was worth at the well, which the oil and gas company would like? Okay, what is a lease? Well, it's both a conveyance and a contract um, because it is a conveyance of property, right? That's a when you transfer property, but it's also a contract with contractual terms. Um, and it's kind of more like a deed. It's almost like a transfer. Uh, it's almost like a permanent transfer of a mineral interest because it includes this right to take substances, use the land, and that right to produce oil and gas could be perpetual as long as oil and gas keeps being produced from that land. So that makes it almost like a land sale. As we'll see, there's a lot of differences, but um, when you're looking at it, it's not, it's not just a contract, it's also a conveyance of land. States actually classify it differently. In Texas, it's described as a fee simple determinable. So, you know, it's a right to property that can be cut off after some period of time. In Oklahoma, as we've described, it's a profit of prom, um, which can be terminated uh, for equitable reasons. Uh, and in a lot of states, it can, its description legally is uncertain or inconsistent. 
Okay, last topic for today. What are the essential clauses of the lease? As we talk about this, you can look at that producer's 88 lease that I gave you. You can see that you can print that out on a legal size piece of paper and you can negotiate that on a hood of a pickup truck, right? These forms are designed to be used in a wide variety of situations, you know, with landowners, maybe, you know, in one, uh, a single afternoon. So paragraph one, what is it? It's the granting clause, which shows the lands described. Paragraph two is called the habendum clause. Habendum, that word is related to habeas corpus. We have the body, right? It's how long you have that lease. And typically that includes both a primary term where you have to explore for oil and gas and then a secondary term, which is keeping that land as long as oil and gas is produced. Uh, paragraph five has a drilling delay rental clause, which is that payment that can be made every year to keep the lease going during that primary term before any drilling has been done. Then there are savings clauses, which basically say, well, even if oil and gas isn't literally being produced from this property, I get to keep holding onto this lease in certain circumstances. So what are those savings clauses? Well, one is if you have a well, your first well you drill just doesn't have oil and gas. You are typically going to have the right to try and drill another well as long as you don't stop looking for oil and gas. Another savings clause is for cessation of production. So if for some reason the oil and gas production just stops for a little bit, often that's not going to immediately cut off the life of the oil and gas lease. Pooling and unitization. So sometimes you won't literally have production on the lease anymore, but there will be production in the unit that it's a part of or in the pooled uh, drilling unit that it's a part of. And in those cases, that will extend the lease. Another one we talked about, shut-in royalty. If you pay the shut-in royalty, that lease extends as well. And finally, force majeure, which is basically something out of my control went wrong. I'm working to fix it. And so the lease should be allowed to continue. That's in paragraph 11 of the example lease that I've given you.